30 Algerian workers have escaped from a gas facility where Islamist militants are holding 20 international employees hostage. The remote facility is now surrounded by Algerian troops as the crisis now enters its second day. The hostage takers say they're demanding the end of France's intervention in Mali and the end of the French military using Algeria's airspace. As the immediate focus is on the safe release of the hostages, how destabilising is this for the wider region? Well, joining us now in the studio is the French-Algerian journalist and regular Monocle contributor Nabila Ramdani. Welcome, Nabila. And on the line is Shashank Joshi, research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute here in London. Nabila, let's uh, begin with you. Um, a couple of days ago, we were discussing this um, unrealised threat uh, from Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb that had been this great. This, this is what precipitated uh, Francois Hollande to send troops to Mali. And there was discussion that no one had ever seen this manifest itself. Suddenly, here we are and it's happening. Well, yes, indeed. I think it's, um, it certainly comes as a surprise for, for, for Western attention. It came to Western attention recently over the ongoing crisis in Mali. But conflicts in that part of the world have been going on uh, for many, many years involving Al-Qaeda-backed uh, groups who have been operating uh, in the area and indeed uh, involved in similar acts of kidnappings uh, or indeed killings of, uh, of Westerners. But the world's attention was focused on other foyers of the war and terror in countries like Afghanistan and indeed Iraq. And this whole crisis uh, following uh, the French military intervention in Mali has brought that uh, problem to the fore. What do we know about Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar? We know he's Algerian. We know he was part of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, but left last year. Well, yes, indeed. Well, he's a, a very unsavoury character and he's certainly well known to the uh, Algerian uh, security forces. Uh, he was born 10 years after Algeria won its independence in 1972 and he started training in Afghan uh, training camps, militant camps, uh, when he was a teenager. And he then returned to Algeria to join the uh, Islamic armed group uh, fighting uh, the Algerian government uh, in a, a murderous uh, civil war, which ended up with 250,000 people killed in, in a decade. And he was a prominent figure in the uh, Al-Qaeda of Islamic Maghreb organization. But when the Algerian security forces managed to drive him out and his men out of the country, he resettled his franchise if I may put it that way, in northern Mali, from where he has been operating since. But he certainly has been involved in um, similar kidnappings in the past. For example, in 2003, he notoriously was behind the kidnapping of 32 European nationals in the southern part of Algeria. But he was also involved in, in 2007, for example, in the murder of French, four French nationals in Mauritania. And he has been condemned many times by Algerian courts in absentia for uh, killing uh, security forces in Algeria as well. Um, Shashank, just listening to that, uh, there's on the one hand, there is surprise that this, um, this kidnapping has happened, but if we have the likes of Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar, who are leading groups who are moving between Algeria and Mali, how international an operation are we talking about here? Well, it was international from the start in some respects, um, insofar as <coughs> the events inside Mali over the past year or so have been certainly, if not catalyzed and perhaps spurred on by the displacement of Tuareg fighters from places like Libya. We know Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb doesn't restrict itself to one country. There are clearly uh, involving not just Algerians, but now also you have Burkina Faso, Nigeria sending troops as part of a multinational African force. So, you know, we could very well see uh, aspects of blowback in all of those countries participating in Mali. Libya is, of course, very close to the site of this hostage taking and is still very vulnerable. It, its government is still uh, has only a very weak grip over its periphery and it, its desert towns. And, um, you know, Algeria, these, these events are fairly rare for Algeria, I think. But um, as Nabila pointed out, this is, you know, this has been, uh, has been brewing. Um, Nabila, Shashank there was mentioning these Tuareg fighters, and there are reports that um, the hostage takers, uh, many of them speak Arabic with a Libyan accent. Um, the Tuaregs uh, uh, occupy a very p a particular role in this, don't they? Because the Algerian government, by all accounts, have, have contacted tribal elders among the Tuaregs, who in turn have got links to Islamist militants connected to al-Qaeda. So how closely knit is this chain? 
Well, all the Al-Qaeda, back to Al-Qaeda-inspired uh, groups uh, are very numerous uh, in the region. But if, as far as the Tuaregs are concerned in particular, they were uh, very prominent fighters uh, alongside Gaddafi, who was very prompt to use uh, them to uh, fight uh, for him. But after his downfall and indeed his killing, uh, they went back home heavily armed and joined uh, forces with uh, Al-Qaeda-inspired groups. And it seems now that they have been sidelined in uh, the uh, fight to take over the whole of Mali uh, in favor of uh, with sorry with um, the more uh, ferocious uh, al qaeda inspired groups taking over um, this time uh, last year when we were talking about um, Libya Shashank, a lot of people were warning that this exact that within a matter of months the fallout from the fall of Gaddafi would um, would be would start to bubble up. Are we seeing this now? Yes, I mean, it's, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a cocktail of factors involved, and I'm, I'm wary of interpretations that say Libya was responsible for Mali. And of course, even if NATO hadn't intervened, um, you may still very well have seen some of the displacement from Libya into Mali. It was a very fragile situation, um, and, and you know, the, 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 this, these sort of events were caused by a number of factors, including the politics of the region as well. Um, but, but, but certainly, you know, this is this is one of the um, one aspect of the spillover from Libya, and it will, as we've seen now in Algeria, have its own spillover. And I think, you know, for all the talk of the prospect of uh, Al Qaeda and other associated groups, because of course it's not just Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb; it's others in the Mali, uh, setting up a sort of safe haven. Um, the, one of the other concerns is is regional spillover. The prospect, not that these bases would be used to destabilize Western Europe or North America. Um, but actually that they would be used to destabilize countries in the region. And I think that's partly what's motivated France and, of course, this, this coalition of African states to act. Um, they're worried really about themselves, not just about Europeans and Americans. And what are the chances of that? Because, we, as you mentioned there, Mali already has had to call in help from the uh, United uh, from, from France um, to, to intervene in trying to drive the rebels out of the north. Um, how much of a, a realistic prospect is that we going to, are we going to have um, an additional destabilization in Mali? And where are the other hotspots that we need to look out for? Well, you've certainly got vulnerable places in, in somewhere, for example, like uh, Mauritania. Um, I mean, Algeria isn't isn't going to it, Algeria is not Mali, of course. It's a, it's a perfectly functioning state. Um, it's not it's not going to you know have big swaths of territory go out of its control as occurred in Mali. Um, but I think you know. It, 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 it's really Libya will also be a major concern because there's a cross-border movement of these networks very fluidly, and the Libyan government just doesn't really have a grip. Certainly in the east, we know you know the Italian consulate in Benghazi has been shut, but also in the south, in the places from which these Barre groups moved, um, the, the government tried to shut the Libyan government tried to shut the border down uh, a couple of months ago, but in reality, it's a weak, feeble force. It can't really do that. So. There, is, there are going to be effects felt in places like Libya as well. I think the irony is actually the, the, there are still big question marks over the extent to which this presents a threat to the West uh, rather than the region. And certainly American officials have been indicating this week that they aren't completely convinced uh, al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb is really that much of a threat uh, in the same way that um, al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula is. So this is, in some ways is very much regionally focused still. Um, Nabila, Shashank just mentioned there that there are weak spots in the likes of Libya, Mauritania, Mali, and he also included uh, Algeria. He said not a, um, you know, a perfectly functioning government, but Algeria ha has a is oil and gas rich, isn't it? That must really put it on the lookout. Well, very much so. And what is uh, actually surprising in this attack is, is that uh, terrorist attacks against oil and gas facilities in Algeria have been pretty rare, uh, even though, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the 1990s, Algeria was dealing with this, um, was fighting against uh, is militant uh, Islamist militants. And Al-Qaeda attacks has have mainly focused on the north of the country, targeting military academies uh, near the capital city. Uh, but I think what uh, Western countries are, are, are realizing now is that they are up against a formidable enemy who won't go away. And, and I think that, you know, we've, we, we're seeing terrorists on the offensive in Mali trying to 
topple the Malian government. But what is more effective in many ways is this kind of small-scale operations uh, against Western interests and crucially against Western lives, who are drawing in Western leaders who have so far ignored that uh, great enemy that they will have to deal with at some point. And the terrorists are only too well of that, too well aware of that. And it's, of course, playing in their hands. Shashank, what would you say to that, the fact that uh, a, sm- a small-scale operation like the one that's happening, a comparatively small scale operation that the likes of the happening in, in Algeria at the moment, uh, could bring in the likes of Japan, the United States, France already, and Britain? Well, I think that's, that's exactly right. And um, it's, 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 it's funny in a way that actually, while the US has stayed out of this, precisely for concern about you know the real threat and what they're getting themselves into, um, if their hostages are killed, you could see more US involvement. And it's, very, it's ironic, really, because, of course, in some ways, that's exactly what al-Qaeda wants in the region. And I think the big question now is, is France far-sighted enough to understand that dynamic, to limit its involvement, to do what needs to be done, but to, as far as possible, to really push extremely hard to get these African forces on the ground, particularly in the north, doing the fighting? And is it enough to make sure it limits its involvement, it doesn't put too many boots on the ground, uh, and actually that it makes sure... Uh, it doesn't give any further excuse for uh, other people to sort of join a wider regional backlash. So um, the possibility of other countries being sucked in is there. But actually, I, I think I think Europe, the Europeans understand that they've been telling France this in, in very clearly uh, that there is a ceiling on their involvement at this point. Uh, and, and France do very well to consider its priority, which I think it is actually, should be to really get ECOWAS uh, on the ground fast. Shashank Joshi and, of course, Nabila Ramdani. Thank you very much indeed for joining us.